Um, so Pentecost um, comes right after the Easter season. We've had um, Jesus with us, visiting with us, much like Mrs. Jacobs um, has come. Thank you, Mrs. Jacobs, for being here. It was really fun to look over and see your face right there. Um, and so we have come and Jesus has convinced us that he really is alive. We've seen his wounds. We've eaten fish with him. Um, but he's not going to stay for forever. And so right before Pentecost comes the ascension, where Jesus gathers his disciples and he rises up back to heaven, back to the Father, but promises to send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and so after his ascension, the disciples do what they were told, as good disciples do, and they return to Jerusalem. This is from the first chapter of Acts, verse 12. Um, and when they had entered, they went to the upper room, we all know, right, where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James, all these with one accord devoted themselves to prayer, hence our upper room prayer devotional, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brethren. The company of persons was in all about 120. And then we get to Peter's speech. The passage that Molly read for us and rocked with all of those names comes to this 120. So often when we think about suddenly a sound from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind fills the house and there appear tongues as a fire distributed and resting on each one of them, we think 12. 12 disciples distributed and resting that tongue of fire on each one. But we forget all the names that I just read. Disciples, yes. Mary's mother, Mary, mother of Jesus, yes. Brothers, yes the company of about 120. That wind and that fire came to all of the disciples, to all who were following Jesus, not just the apostles. And so I want us to soak that in a little bit today, that this gift, that this advocacy, that this spirit of truth is for each and every one of us. And especially on a week like this one, where there have been a lot of dark nights. It's been one of those waves. It always comes in waves in Epworth. It's been a week of that wave for us. I stand in front of the altar with flowers from Jack's funeral yesterday. And all who gathered here to celebrate his life. And it was a beautiful 94 years full, 67 of those with Irma of a beautiful life, but even in that celebration of something that well-lived and a death that, that is that beautiful and good, it's still hard and painful. Not to mention deaths like Deb's cousin's wife that end too soon. So for all of the great battles that each of us are fighting, some spoken today, some known in Santa Fe, for all the wounds that these shootings open up for all who have been affected. I want to do something different. I would like to lead us, not a sermon, but a guided meditation of what it might have been like if we were one of those 120 in that room facing our own fear and our own dark night, waiting for whatever this Holy Spirit is going to be to come, but knowing that Jesus is gone, that the Roman Empire is still very much fully intact and there, and that there are very real things to fear and grave injustice and harm around every corner. The disciples who are gathered in that room praying were no strangers to dark nights. And so for us and for a way to figure out how to move through those in a way of faith and in a way of hope, I'd like us to shake our bodies out, get your feet plant firmly on the floor, and take a deep breath in and let it out. Make sure your exhale is longer than your inhale. Close your 
close your eyes if you like. Leave them open. Get a picture of the flames of the stained glass. Remember that breath itself is a reminder of the Holy Spirit, is a reminder of our creation of God breathing across chaos and bringing forth life. And as you are able to settle in, join with me. This is a gift from one of my colleagues, Bonnie McCubbin, who wrote this. One more breath, one more opening of heart and imagination. Now, remember that room we just talked about, that Molly read about, where the 120 disciples were gathered. Make yourself one of them. Doing what Jesus told you to do, going back to Jerusalem and waiting for the Holy Spirit. But it's been so long and nothing. What if it never comes? Could we have missed it? What if the authorities find us first? What if they crucify us? Everyone keeps waiting. Except now it's more like huddling in fear and the room is feeling really cramped. What does it feel like to be in hiding? Remember, Jesus' mother, Mary, is here. And, you know, she knows Jesus better than anyone here. She was the one that gave birth to him. And now, as the church is supposed to be born too, she's here again. And she knows about the Holy Spirit. She's felt it before. It came over her. When the day the angel told her that she would bear Christ. Listen to her. What is she saying? Suddenly, out of nowhere, a big noise, a noise louder than you've ever heard before, comes sweeping through the room. No, not just the room. It's as if it's sweeping through you, like your very bones are shaking with it. It looks like Peter is talking, but you can't hear him anymore. Can you even breathe anymore? How does it feel as it floods your body? Chills start at the base of your spine and travel up your back to your shoulders. Then the chills move down your arms and into your fingers. It's also descending down your legs, past your knees, into your toes. You have chills, but you aren't cold. Could it be? Is it happening? Is this what the Holy Spirit feels like?
Now something that reminds you of a flame of fire appears and dances in the air. It splits and a small flame wiggles and flashes above the head of every person in the room, all 120 of us. And it doesn't burn us, but it comes with an intensity you can't put words to. This has to be the Holy Spirit. Nothing else could have this much power. Overflowing from your heart, your mind, your body, your strength, everything is so alive. Was this version of me inside me all the time? Is this how Jesus felt all the time? Yeah, we've definitely felt the power of the Holy Spirit. Something inside of us is absolutely different. So what are we going to do? There's no going back now. Not after this. You see some of the disciples going outside. Will you go with them? It doesn't sound like anyone is afraid anymore. What will you tell the crowds about Jesus? How will you use this power that the Holy Spirit has given you? As you're ready, take a breath, open your eyes, come back to the present. Holy Spirit still here too. The gift that was poured out to the 120 in that room continues to be poured out today for anyone who seeks to follow Christ, for anyone who seeks the truth of love, of justice and righteousness, of shalom. This is the power that can make our dark nights dawn, and that can make that dawn noonday light that can turn tears into laughter and fear into joy. The dark nights have power. Evil is real. There's a reason the very first question of our baptism is to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world. But we're not left to do that on our own. Do not forget the power that you have in the Holy Spirit to bring forth life in the midst of death and wholeness in the midst of brokenness. That can help us discover a version of ourselves, the divine image in which we are created, that we couldn't even imagine. That we have not let God clear a way to give us access to. These disciples were able to make all the room 
and their hearts, their souls, their mind, and their strength for God's Holy Spirit. And because they were, they were able to speak in languages that every single person there could understand. To be able to share a power and a love and a hope that the world desperately needed and thousands were added to that 120 that day. Because there was a message that was shared that was needed in a way that brought hope that others could find real and grab a hold of. Friends, if we have gone through dark nights this week, our world is going through those same and more. The difference is the Holy Spirit. So will we share the power that is ours that guides us through? Will we walk out that room and preach God's love and give an account for the joy that lies within us? Or are we really going to stay huddled in fear after all this? Please, please let that not be our decision. Please let us not waste the power that is ours, the gifts that God has given us, the transformation and the life made abundant and joy made complete that can happen. Today we celebrate many people who have been already living that call and who have chosen to make it official. There are five commitments that we ask for membership for disciples. Tim, you're here. Yay. Talk about making it through a dark night and getting here. All right. Thanks for that witness and testimony. And so we're going to ask for those members to come forward, and we're going to ask for them to take vows of joining us in prayers and presence and gifts and service and in witness. And we're going to ask for all of those of us who have made these vows to remember them and to actually live them out.